Hi, this is Ellie Gettinger, Education Director at the Jewish Museum Milwaukee. And since my Facebook Live wasn't working, I thought I'd try this on YouTube and see how it works from here. I'll share this with the Facebook page afterwards, and maybe I can figure out how to stream the two. Anyway, we are talking about part two of the Settlement Cookbook and why it's so important and what uh, and, and in order to get to the part about the settlement cookbook, we need to figure out how the settlement house happens. So in part one, we discussed a young German Jewish American girl named Lizzie Kander, who was part of kind of the elite of Milwaukee in the early part of the, the late 1800s, early 1900s. And after she graduates from high school, she is now in this position where she can't really, she's not supposed to work. She's a woman of means. Um, she doesn't really have the ability to go on to school or to higher learning. And so what is left open for her is getting married, which she does. She marries a real estate magnate. His name is Simon Kander. I think he's about 13 years her senior. Um, and they never have kids, which is the other thing that was kind of expected of women of that time. So Lizzie and Simon set about building a life for themselves both of them are quite influential in their own right. Simon at one point um, is in the state assembly. And Lizzie is involved in all sorts of philanthropic endeavors in the city of Milwaukee. Um, for instance, she is a truant officer. So she is going out to schools and or to people's homes and seeing why their children aren't in schools. And one of the communities that she's really addressing is the new immigrant community of Jews from Russia and Eastern Europe. There was a massive wave of Jewish immigration to the United States from 1880 to about 1922. Most of these people are coming from Russia and Poland and Lithuania and Hungary, places like this. And while they're Jewish, so there's this sense of affiliation and kinship in that way, there's a sense of distance between the German Jewish community and the Eastern European Jewish community. There's not this sense of like, hey, everything should be together. We're, we're doing this. Um, there's this sense of, well, are these new immigrants going to look badly on us? What can we do to make sure that we're responding to their needs in part so that this doesn't become a public relations issue? for the broader Jewish community. So as Lizzie's going out to these new immigrants, the big thing that she keeps seeing is that kids aren't in school. And a lot of the reason that kids aren't in school is because their parents are working. Um, and if you have, say, a three-year-old, as probably a lot of us right now who have three-year-olds at home, with maybe somewhat older children, maybe a six, seven, eight-year-old, but you're putting a lot of responsibility oh. on that six, seven, eight-year-old. You're saying, hey, six, seven, eight-year-old, what can we do to uh, to make this right? Can you help out in the house? Can you do these things? And in this case, many of those older children were responsible for looking after younger children and they weren't going to school. So that was one of many issues she saw. She was concerned about hygiene. She was concerned about nutrition. And she was concerned about the overall um, aesthetics of how these very impoverished Jews would reflect on her kind of more affluent society. So she looks at these issues and says, okay, I'm going to create a center. And initially her big focus is going to be around issues of hygiene. She works with the breweries along the river and she works with them to pump in their excess waste water that is warm but clean into a shower system. You pay a penny, you get a shower. Amazing, right? You're like, oh, great. I, I would love a, a warm shower in this age of not non-indoor plumbing. However, the big challenge was the name. At the time, her initial name was the Keep Clean Mission. It is a terrible name for a social service organization. And many of the people who wanted, who would have wanted this kind of service were turned off by the name itself and wouldn't go to the Keep Clean Mission. So she's like, fine, I can change the PR around this. And she changes the name to the Settlement House. And the organization doesn't just provide showers. It provides all sorts of lessons and clubs and activities and ways and childcare and things to help out these new immigrant families. It's going to teach them how to be American. It's going to teach them English. Um, there's going to be civic engagement, all sorts of things that you can do through the settlement house. We have in our archive, this fabulous memory that was submitted by a, uh, a lady whose mother 
was a partaker of these kinds of activities at the settlement house. Her name, the writer's name is Tilly Bootson, and she's one of the mothers of a former docent. And so I always love this. She starts by saying, the Abraham Lincoln house was our second home. We spent many happy hours there. For my mother, it was a second life. She wanted to learn to speak English correctly and the new ways of living in this, their adopted country. My parents had six children, three boys and three girls. As soon as the kids were off to school, mother quickly did her demanding chores and we all came home for lunch. No school lunch program in those days. No school lunch program in these days either. After we ate, we were all back on our way and mother was also on her way to Mrs. Simon Kander's settlement house. There, the foreigner women would gather to learn the language and to become Americans so that they could keep up with their Yankee Doodle children. And I love this story. I think it's amazing. One of the things that Lizzie thought about in terms of providing services for her this for this population was thinking about cooking classes. And the cooking classes were for young women. And the young women were going to take these cooking classes and they were going to learn how to cook like an American. Cooking like an American did not mean cooking like what we consider American food, although if you start going into it, most of those foods are, are immigrant foods as well. Pete's from Italy, hamburgers and hot dogs are from Germany. Um, but she's going to teach them how to cook like an upper class German Jewish lady. So it means that you're going to learn how to set a table with your fish fork and your dessert spoon, things that every immigrant household will certainly have. And you're going to learn how to cook, you know, those kind of all American favorites like kuchen and schnecken and kuchen tarts and apple kuchen, you know, those sorts of things that we all think of as, as being incredibly American uh, treats. And it's a program that goes on. And actually we have a great picture of the cooking class from 1907. You can see it right here. Um, and to me, it always, in looking at this picture, I am struck by the technology here that I would expect that they're cooking over some sort of fire, but they're not. They have some sort of induction surface. There's a lady at the front. One of the big challenges with the cooking class was the idea of kashrut. Many of the German ladies who were part of the settlement cookbooks establishment and leadership weren't kosher, didn't keep kosher. And how do you reflect that to a population that does? And how do you make sure that you are maintaining their level of kashrut? So this is one of those things where you get some back and forths between Lizzie and her board and the people who are cooking to remind them that they actually need to keep meat and milk separate. They need to keep their, um, they need to make sure they're not using pork. They need to ensure that what they're, they're teaching the girls is within the lines of what they can do religiously. Her goal for these classes was that she was training them. She wanted them to aspire to a life like hers on one hand. And on the other hand, she saw them as potentially being um, future domestic servants, that she was training them for work in a household like hers. So as I said, there's some really interesting as far as... Um, Evaluating this from a uh, motivation standpoint, you know, is the motivation all 100% altruistic? No. But does it do an immense amount of good in this community at the turn of the 20th century? It does. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Tomorrow, we're going to get into the, um, the settlement cookbook itself and how it was published and why it was published. It's a great story. You won't want to miss it. Keep cooking, keep uh, going through all of these things. I know cookbooks right now are kind of this like valuable resource, all of the different recipes. So if you want in the comments, share what you're cooking right now and what's giving you kind of comfort as we're in this time of like extreme uh, in inbound, homebound uh, life. Thanks very much.